When we landed in this colony, two different masters went. For little trifling offences, boys to Hobart Town Jail were sent. Now the second sentence we received, and ordered for to be, sent to Macquarie Harbour, that place of tyranny. For 11 years in the early 19th century, the British colonial government of Van Diemen's Land, in what is now Australia, operated one of the most vicious institutions in Australian history, a far-flung outpost on the edge of the world that, to the convicts who were sent there, became known as Pluto's Land, after the ancient Greek god that ruled the underworld. This place was the Macquarie Harbour Penal Station. In 1822, the Government of New South Wales established a new penal settlement far to the south in Van Diemen's Land, or Tasmania as it is now called. At the time, there were just two major settlements on the island, Hobart in the south and Launceston in the north. But this new settlement was not going to be in the north or the south, it was going to be in the west in the vast waters of Macquarie Harbour, on a spit of land called Sarah Island. The new colony was partially intended to exploit the region's huge forests of hue and pine, which still cover the landscape to this day. Hue and pine is a native wood that was known to be light, strong, and exceedingly resistant to rot, all qualities that made it ideal for shipbuilding an industry that was to be key to the colony's economic development. However, this economic activity was only the secondary purpose of the outpost. This was a convict station, but not just any convict station. Its primary purpose was to serve as a place to send those who committed new offences after arriving in the colonies, the troublemakers and the absconders a place of banishment in a colony populated by the banished, a prison of last resort. One look at the local geography gives a pretty good indication as to why it was chosen. For one, unlike the penal settlements at Sydney or Hobart, it was an island. However, even if a convict did manage to abscond to the main island, life only became harder from then on, because Macquarie Harbour is surrounded on all sides by some of the most unforgiving landscape on the Australian continent. The western half of Tasmania is characterised by a series of mountain ranges. The so-called West Coast Range borders Macquarie Harbour and is typified by jagged peaks, cliffs, deep ravines and gorges, fast-flowing rivers, high rainfall, and an ecology defined alternatively by huge swaths of temperate rainforest and barren moors. The terrain is so rugged that much of it, particularly in the southwest, was not properly mapped until the 1980s, and previous surveys, such as that conducted by Thomas Scott in 1824, simply depict the harbour as surrounded by blank space, true uncharted wilderness. Little wonder then that while assessing the proposal for the penal station in 1818, Governor Lachlan Macquarie, for whom the harbour is named, proclaimed that escape from thence would be next to impossible, adding that as a place where the worst description of convicts could be safely banished to labour for the public good, I am inclined to think it would answer remarkably well. However, it was not just the terrain that was daunting. The climate was often downright hostile. The west coast of Tasmania is entirely at the mercy of a potent combination of the frigid waters of the Antarctic Ocean and the powerful winds of the Roaring Forties. The coastline is frequently assailed by cold fronts, powerful storms and vicious winds. In fact, the cold winds were so strong and so persistent that the overseers of the penal station were eventually forced to construct a series of elaborate windbreak defences, including a barrier wall 2 feet thick and 26 feet or 8 metres high. Even still, the barracks on Sarah Island was notoriously drafty. The barracks on Small Island, 
where new prisoners on probation and the chain gang were housed, was even worse, with those quartered there forced to huddle together for warmth. And to make matters worse still, it rains. A lot. The average annual rainfall of Tasmania is more than double that of the next most state, and most of that rain falls on the west coast, making it one of the wettest places in Australia. In fact, it rained so much that when the convicts of Sarah Island attempted to establish crops in the optimistically named Farm Cove, their efforts came to naught. The ground was simply too wet and the soil too poor. The only food the residents of the penal station could grow themselves were some potatoes and turnips on semi-sheltered Phillips Island, but this was nowhere near enough to feed the entire population. As such, the outpost had to be regularly resupplied by sea. Even this was no easy task. Though Hobart and the Macquarie Harbour Penal Station are just 170 kilometres apart as the crow flies, and the sea journey between them is roughly 210 nautical miles, frequent bouts of severe bad weather and violent storms meant ships had to seek shelter in a series of bays and inlets and then slowly make their way north up the coast, all the while being battered by dangerous winds constantly driving them towards the jagged shoreline. The rough seas meant that for the convicts kept below deck, this was not a pleasant journey to say the least. Nor was it a short one. The average sailing time from Hobart to Macquarie Harbour was 27 days. In contrast, the return journey could take as few as four. And even arriving at Macquarie Harbour was not the end of the challenges, because in order to enter the harbour, ships had to traverse the passage known as Hell's Gates. Though the convicts would later take this name as referring to the nightmarish fate that awaited all who were sent to Sarah Island, Hell's Gates was actually named by the sailors who had to make the perilous passage. The channel is incredibly shallow, with a depth of just 9 feet, and could only be navigated at high tide because at other times a rapid current surged through the gap, threatening to smash any unprepared vessels on the rocks. Vessels had to be unloaded, guided into the harbour by a dedicated pilot while their cargo was carried overland, and then reloaded before docking at Sarah Island. The inability to grow sufficient food on site and the difficulty of supply meant that malnourishment was rife among the convict population. But even apart from the isolated location, the terrible weather, the nightmarish journey by sea, and the fearsome landscape, the worst part was undoubtedly the penal station itself. Every morning there was a roll call. Any who failed to answer their name were flogged. For breakfast, they were each given a litre and a half of skilly, a thin broth made from oatmeal and water. After breakfast, they were assigned to their work crews and sent on their way. There were several tasks to which convicts could be assigned. Some were sent to Brickmaker's Bay, others to Charcoal Burner's Bluff or Coal Head, and some were even sent on a three-month stint at Lime Kiln Reach. Later, shipbuilding would become the primary industry, with the station becoming the hub of ship construction in the entire Australian colony. However, most convicts were sent to harvest timber. All of these assignments involved backbreaking labour, though the logging was an order of magnitude harder and more dangerous. To make matters worse, this hard labour had to be done without food during the day as giving the convicts something to eat while on the mainland was seen as creating an unacceptable risk of absconding. Attempts to smuggle even the smallest morsel of food off Sarah Island were severely punished. James Robinson was sentenced to 100 lashes and 6 months in the chain gang for being caught with cooking fat in his possession. Jonathan Smith was sent to the chain gang and given 50 lashes 
for trying to smuggle a biscuit into the gangboat. These judgments, as with all judgments handed down in the penal station, were made by the Commandant of the Outpost, Lieutenant John Cuthbertson of the 48th Regiment. As far as the Commandant was concerned, Macquarie Harbour was his kingdom. He was both Master of Sarah Island and its Magistrate. Cuthbertson was a man endowed with extraordinary authority, able to control every aspect of the lives of those put under his jurisdiction. Detailed records from the station paint a picture of a man who was more than willing to subject his charges to vicious reprisal for the most minor offences. Committing a nuisance, 25 lashes. Losing through neglect or disposing of his shirt, 50 lashes and 6 months in irons. Destroying through neglect a trust belonging to the government, 7 days bread and water. Entering the quarters of Lieutenant John Cuthbertson and stealing plums and tea, 100 lashes, and you can tell he took that one personally. Absconding into the woods, 100 lashes and 6 months in irons. When convict James Mason chopped off two of his fingers, probably with an axe and possibly by accident, Cuthbertson charged him with damaging himself in order to deprive the government of his labour. 50 lashes. While these are objectively high numbers, the dry dispassionate tone of this record does not match the real-life implications of its content. To quote historian Hamish Maxwell Stewart, how easily 100 strokes slides off the tongue, and yet how hard it is to comprehend the savagery of such a punishment. The victims were stripped to the waist and bound, legs splayed, hands above their head, to a wooden stand known as a triangle. On Sarah Island, the triangle stood just above the waterline. Beside them lay a long planked gangway. Cuthbertson personally supervised each flogging, walking up and down the gangway. The strokes were timed to match his pace. When he turned on his heel at the end of the gangway, a new stroke was dealt. In this way, Cuthbertson even controlled the pace of the floggings he had ordered, walking faster or slower according to his whim. It was not uncommon for a flogging of 100 lashes to take over an hour to complete. The tool used to punish the convicts was the cat, a flogger with nine strands of woven whipcord, each with at least seven knots in them. The version used at Sarah Island, the so-called Macquarie Cat, was said to be both longer and thicker than usual, and had small pieces of metal sewn into the knots. Such a weapon had the victims bleeding into their boots after just a few strokes. 100 strokes had the potential to cut to the bone and could even kill a man. Cuthbertson drowned in December 1823 while leading an attempt to recover a vessel that had broken its mooring lines in a storm. In the previous 12 months, he had ordered a total of 9,100 lashes, inflicted on a population of convicts not much more than 150 at any one time. On one occasion, the convict charged with wielding the cat, and it always was a convict who was doing the flogging, dealt 1,700 strokes in a single week. There are very few descriptions of Cuthbertson from those who met him, but one of those that has survived comes from a convict known simply as Davis, who described him as the most inhuman tyrant the world had ever produced since the reign of Nero. Unfortunately for the convicts, Cuthbertson's successes as commandant were not much better and the cruelty would remain a feature until the station was closed in 1833, though it may be said that it did not again reach the heights of brutality achieved under Cuthbertson's rule. Still, over the 11 years of its operation, 1,152 convicts were sent to Sarah Island. A total of 1,231 floggings were carried out during that time with an average of 6,744 lashes a year. 
between the hostile environment and the brutality of life in the outpost. For the convicts, the sea journey from Hobart to Macquarie Harbour represented nothing less than a descent into hell. Though Macquarie Harbour was intended as a prison of last resort, and had quickly gained a reputation throughout the colonies as housing the worst kind of people, the true degenerates. In truth, this was not the case. The worst crimes, such as murder or rape, were capital offences, and so those convicted of such offences were simply sent straight to the gallows to hang. Of all the convicts sent to Sarah Island, just 3% were guilty of crimes involving violence. Some had never been convicted of anything at all. And yet, these same people committed some truly deranged acts of violence while they were there. On one occasion, the convict William Saul caught a snake. His friend William Allen asked Saul to give him the animal. When Saul refused, Allen attacked him with a knife, stabbing him in the face, throat and finally in the heart. He then disemboweled his friend and cut off his genitalia. On another occasion, the convict John Mayo had just disembarked on the shore to begin the day's work harvesting timber when he drove his axe into the head of the man who just happened to be in front of him. He later said he had no issues with the man he had killed. The poor fellow was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. One convict made a deal with some confederates to supply the slush skimmed from the top of the meat boiler, and when he later reneged on the deal, he had his throat cut, all for what amounted to a few ounces of fat. Another man was murdered with an axe while he slept, the weapon buried deep in his skull. The motive for this killing is unknown. Given that many of the perpetrators in these cases, and many others, had no prior history of violent crimes or behaviour, there can be little doubt that the root cause of these horrific acts of violence was the nightmare of life on Sarah Island itself. In 1827, a group of convicts held in the chain gang on Small Island managed to saw through their irons and murder one of the constables guarding their quarters. Since the commandant had no power to try capital offences, the convicts were dispatched to Hobart, where they were sentenced to hang, an outcome that was precisely what they wanted. The unfortunate constable was merely a means to an end. Similarly, the standard punishment for absconding, 100 lashes and 6 months in irons, was eventually reduced in the late 1820s to 50 lashes, because absconders often chose to starve in the wilderness, then return to face yet another flogging. And for all Governor Macquarie's belief that it was impossible to escape from Macquarie Harbour, there was certainly no shortage of convicts prepared to try. Many disappeared into the wilderness, never to be seen again. Others were found by search parties, often starving due to lack of supplies, while still others were killed by their fellow escapees or the local indigenous tribe. Most who absconded from Macquarie Harbour failed in their bid for freedom either through death or recapture. However, there are a few who did manage to escape, and their stories range from epic displays of cunning to disturbing demonstrations of just how far people will go to survive. But those are tales for another day. The Macquarie Harbour Penal Station was formally closed in 1833 after 11 years of service. Though there were certainly some in colonial society who had strong moral objections to the barbarity of the station, and life for the convicts did improve marginally over the years, the primary factor was the sheer financial cost of maintaining such an isolated outpost, especially when the alternative penal station at Port Arthur, established in 1830, could already house more than double the population of Sarah Island at its peak, and at half the cost at that. To put it simply, the Macquarie Harbour penal station was no longer worth it. And so one of the most brutal chapters of Australian history came to a close. Writing two decades later, historian John West described the Macquarie Harbour penal station as a place associated exclusively 
with remembrance of inexpressible depravity, degradation and woe. A place where men lost the aspect and heart of man. 